We're in a series called Faithful, a guide to living in a post-Christian world, studying the book of Daniel, its first six chapters. And last week, we looked at Daniel and his buddies as they were literally taken out of their homeland in the very same place that everything is going on right now. We learned from their example there in the first chapter what it looks like in some ways to be faithful. It means, as they did, to to take a stand in your life, to know what you believe in these years as a young adult, to understand what God has called you to, do not shy away from. And those beliefs are in many ways. It affects your practical life, your thought life, your belief systems, your ways of interacting with each other, just so much. Secondly, we saw that Daniel and his friends stood together in those spaces of just wanting to navigate, how do we live in this world? Well, one of the best ways we can do it is do it in faithfulness together. And that was a really important thing. And then thirdly, we saw last week that when they stood together and when they stood for something of value, it impacted the people around them. And recognizing that your stand in faithfulness in the small ways and the big ways, it impacts people for the better. And so don't think that God doesn't see it in others And so recognize that your faithfulness has ripple effects that go beyond. But tonight we enter now into a different space in Daniel chapter 2. And it seems as though Daniel and his buddies kind of have things going on. And they're, hey, we're making a stand. We're going to do something good. God is going to bless. And he did bless. Literally the text said that the Lord blessed Daniel and his friends. But that doesn't always hold for all of your life. And it doesn't mean that as Christian believers that we won't experience trial, suffering, hardship, and burden, even though we follow Jesus. One of the most challenging things for the believer is to look at our suffering in this world very moment right now, both out there and within here, and within here, say, God, come on, why? Why? It's difficult. It's very difficult and it's very challenging. But here we encounter something now of a different nature. I've entitled this kind of experience that we're going to have today, right now, in this moment, Uncertainty Seeks for Certainty, Living in the Liminal Space. I don't know how many of you understand that young adulthood is a time of uncertainty. Can I get an amen? You know what it's like to live in the uncertainty. You understand the feeling of being trapped, not knowing, wishing you understood that this way of life would be over at some point, that it would just get more clear. God, I need to know. Does he like me? Does she like me or not? Will I pass this class or not? God, will I finally get a job or not? Will I have a stable place to live or not? Lord, will I be able to pay this off? Can I get papers to be free in this country? God, can I get the Lord, please help. Everywhere you turn, there is some issue of uncertainty. Whether it's in the space of just literally not having the practical needs of your life or what you're yearning for deep in your heart. Uncertainty in this years of young adulthood is prevalent. It is an uncertain time. It is the season in which you're living in what you have in the present and what you wish would come in the future. There's a unique word that we could use as one sociologist and theologian calls this space the liminal space. Liminal space is the time between what was and that which is next. It is a place or a time of transition, a time of waiting and not knowing the future. Liminal spaces are extremely challenging to live in. And for most of us, we find these spaces really hard. And whatever we can do, we want to seek certainty in these spaces. I don't want to live here in this time right now too much longer than I need to. I want to get out, want to get graduated, want to get him, want to get her, want to get this car, want to get this job, want to land this house, want to get, and there's all these wants that we have, and it's just like, God, can I just get from here to here quick? I'm tired. I like, I need the microwave experience. Come on. And so we yearn for the certain in the seasons of uncertainty. We live in liminality. 
For many of young adults, this season brings a lot of anxiety. Some of you, just hearing me talk about this, you already got a little bit more anxious. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that, but sorry. For many young adults, they want to find solutions to that. Interestingly, young adults are the greatest consumer of certainty. What do I mean by that? Well, studies have found that young adults purchase certainty at a greater extent than any other generation that we have in the United States today. What does that look like? Well, it starts in the most innocent ways of going out to Chinese food and getting a fortune cookie. Hey, what's your fortune? What's my fortune? Hey, man, I like your support. You trade. I ain't trade with you. Are you kidding me? No way. I like this one. But then it moves into spaces of, hey, that's a nice lucky charm. Like, hey, it helps me. I get what I need. Then it moves into spaces of potentially now where you begin paying for things in non-Christian spaces like tarot card sessions, Ouija boards, astrological energy crystals, palm readers, astro projecting, finding ways to get the answers to what you need. Young adults in this space, millennials and kind of our older Gen Zers spend over in the billions of dollars to find out what is coming in the future. A third of Americans read the horoscope every day, change their life based on this because it's going to tell me what's to come. I want to make sure I don't rub things the wrong way. If I rub the genie the wrong way, hey, something else is going to come out. I need to know what is going to happen. I need to know how to act. I need to know how to be because it might affect the future. In our ways of trying to find certainty, we also move into just ways that we think is going to help us. The text that we find here now in Daniel chapter 2 really speaks into this idea of uncertainty. Will there ever be peace in the Middle East? Will I ever find peace in my life? Will things just stabilize finally? And so we jump into our text here in Daniel chapter 2. And we encounter a unique circumstance. Nebuchadnezzar, this man who the book of Isaiah says was actually God's tool. Strange thing to say that literally this man who took God's people into oppression and exile would have been a tool for the Lord. But you begin to realize as you study the history of what happened, it begins to kind of make sense. Wow, Lord, you're using this man. You're teaching him things too. And we'll see that in subsequent chapters. But you see that Nebuchadnezzar, this man, he has this strange dream. He has such a unique dream that it keeps him up at night. He's, he's just paralyzed in the morning, and he's like, whoa, what was this about? Nebuchadnezzar was surrounded by the most trained individuals of the entire Babylonian empire. That known world, this was the largest empire. He had the best of the best people who could tell him anything astrologers, people who could tell oracles. In that time, he had people who could study the stars in such precision that they knew what was coming in the next season, how they aligned together and what the temperatures would be like. I mean, they were both scientists and you could say fairy tale guessers. And so he gathered all of these intellectuals around him and he told them what had happened to him that night. And he said, I need all of you to understand that what I'm asking you is very important. I need you to tell me the interpretation of my dream. This wasn't uncommon. Many of them were famed and known interpreters of the dreams of the kings, those who had lived before Nebuchadnezzar and those of his stature there and now and his other rulers who were wealthy merchants. And they would seek out these intellectuals of the court can you tell us, well, yes, tell me the dream. What's going on? And they would recount the dream, and these people would give them an interpretation. I don't know how many of you go by those dreams and interpretations. I don't know how many of you get these dreams that kind of tell you what's to come sometimes. In my family, my dad, he gets unique dreams, I'll tell you. Sometimes you think, Dad, you ate too much. This, I don't know. And then he interprets his dream, and man, there were these two snakes that came in my dream. I think God is trying to tell me something is coming. There's going to be two battles occurring. And man, he has dreams, I'll tell you. And he has his interpretations. I don't know how many of you have parents to that, or maybe some of you. 
And I don't discredit dreams. Friends, I don't discredit them, and I'm not trying to make light of them either, because what we're about to see is that God speaks through dreams too. Pay attention. While Nebuchadnezzar doesn't do something, he doesn't tell the intellectuals that are surrounding him the actual dream. You're not going to tell us the dream? No. I will not tell you the dream. Not only could he not tell them the full dream, he didn't fully understand or remember the whole dream, but he didn't want to tell them anything. He wanted to test them. And so we jump into the text now in verse 10 of chapter 2. Look at this with me. The astrologers answered the king, there is no way on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, whoever great or mighty has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. They do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious, he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. Why did it make him furious? He paid them well. I thought you guys knew what you were doing. Well, well, we, well we do kind of maybe just if you, well, okay, we don't. He put them to the test, and they answered him correctly. Only the gods know the solution, and only the gods could tell you what your dream was. But their gods weren't speaking to them. Their gods didn't say a thing. So the decree was issued, verse 13, to put the wise men to death. The wise men sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Just because you're on God's side in this life doesn't mean you're not going to encounter serious trials and hardships. Daniel and his friends, it said in chapter 2, in chapter 1, were blessed. It said that God blessed them. But still they encounter this challenge. Now verse 14, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. This guy had sword pulled, ready. Gents, get over here. You know, just you being here tonight is an act of courage and heroism. You have to realize. You know, a lot of times we talk about our Christian freedom in this country never being under attack. As the world doesn't find peace in these moments, unfortunately, in Middle Eastern turmoil, many times, whether it be Islam, or Christianity, or Judaism, these houses of worship come under attack around the world. Just you being here itself is an act of heroism. You realize you're taking a step of faith to walk into spaces of worship. These are times we begin to realize, wow, so much of the world lives under the persecution to worship God. And here you are tonight. So what the king asked was to put everyone to death. But Daniel spoke up. We encounter something really heroic about Daniel. He literally has a sword pulled, you could say, maybe to his throat, maybe up, and Daniel talks his way out of it. Some of you really know how to talk really well. I sit down with people sometimes, and and one or the other spouse, kind of dating partner, really has a great way of communicating. When we talk about conflict, one spouse or partner, man, they just know how to use their words wisely. The other one is still, hey, I got to process, I got to think. Daniel was quick. He understood what to say. Verse 15, he asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king to ask for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house, explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Praise be to the God of heaven forever and ever, for power are his. And Daniel goes into a prayer. 
wow. Now, at this point, a lot of you can recite to me what's about to happen. You've been through prophecy seminars maybe, and you'll see the statue emerge, gold, silver, bronze, iron, then iron mix. I got him. Got him, bro. <laughs> wrong spot and wrong time. Come on, man. Got him. I'm quick like that, man. I'm quick. <laughs> okay. In my preaching mode, man. And then all of a sudden, this statue emerges in the dream. Daniel tells him every single account of the dream, the statue, and what it means then. And then he recounts to him the interpretation of the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar stunned, wait a minute. Whoa. And he begins to recount that each of these medals points to a kingdom. And each in a time period, these are kings that will come. You are the gold. Ooh. Gives him a little praise. You ever want to kind of butter someone up? You could say God was buttering Nebuchadnezzar up in this moment. You are the gold. Wow. And then their inferior kingdom will come. And an inferior kingdom will come. And an inferior kingdom. And then he gets to this last part about a rock that's going to come down. And it will destroy all of the empires. All these powerful communities that are vying for power, they will all be destroyed. You know what I'm going, friends? Verse 44. And in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not of human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. This rock, the Bible points to both in the New Testament and Old, pointed to a rock that people could find healing with or would be struck down with. This rock represented Jesus himself, a rock that was not formed by hands. Literally, the miraculous birth of Jesus could not be taken credit by any human, for it was by the Holy Spirit. Now, I could get into a moment with all of you if we want to do some Adventist prophecy telling, did you understand that the kingdom of Babylon would be followed by the Medes and the Persians, and then these guys, and then the Romans, and then this one. And do you understand the significance of what that means? God can tell the future. Now some of you would argue with me, well, no, this was from the second century. Daniel didn't know. We could get in a whole disagreement here. But Daniel, too, spends a lot of time on this dream, and he spends a lot of time emphasizing this last point. In ancient storytelling, that final one single point was so significant because it was the point of all of it. The point of all of it was that there is a kingdom coming. Friends, a kingdom coming that will destroy the violence of this world. And it's a strange thing to think that it will come by violence. It will become by destruction. But you see, this God of grace and mercy also must be a God of final justice. Because this justice of God is also good. A justice of God that says, I do not stand for my children to be killed. I do not stand for unrighteousness to live any longer, that pain would exist anymore. No, I do not stand with it. There will be a kingdom that will last forever. Will you align yourself with that kingdom? It's hard. Man, it is hard. It is hard to stand for Christ in this age. It is. Man, I tell you, friends, it is not easy for me as a pastor even. If the screen would be recounting what pastors have been known for in this age, you would cry with me. Friends of mine who go through things that you're like, oh, man. And that's the space of this world, this modern world that we live in. And so we ask ourselves now, well, God, what are we to do in this space? This space of uncertainty, of, of crisis, what do we do? Well, you see, it's interesting. Daniel was known as a prophet, but there was also a parallel prophet that was around in that same time period, the prophet Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah tried to warn the king of Israel, listen, align yourself with the kingdom. Don't fight against the Babylonians. You will lose. Listen to the word of the Lord. Don't fight against them. Didn't want to listen. Ellen White in Patriarchs and Kings talks about the fact that the king of Judah and Israel at that time did not want to stand for what was right because he was afraid of what the people would say. Isn't that the tough thing? So many times when, when we know kind of those small and big ways that God calls us to be faithful, man, it's like, oh, Lord, what are they going to say, though, if I do this, if I don't do that? It's hard. The pressure is hard. I remember as a camp counselor one time, I was supposed to do an event, and man, there were some people that had gotten way out of hand, and I got scared as a leader. Kelly, talk about being a pastor and having to make calls sometimes. Man, it's hard to be a pastor and lead. I was the camp counselor and chaplain that summer there at Camp Myvedon. Anyone ever go there? You got enough P&W people? Pacific Northwesters? Okay. And I had to make a call. And I was scared to make the call. Why? Because I knew I wouldn't be liked after I made the call. I was scared that if I kind of pointed something out, that man, Philip, are you kidding me? Get off your horse, bro. I know what you do. I understand you. I get it. And I was afraid. It's tough. But you see, Jeremiah tells the king of, of a word of caution. He doesn't listen. Boom, they go into exile. They lose a lot of lives. But you see, the prophet Jeremiah doesn't only leave his people even after they make a mistake. You see, that's the kind of God we serve who even when we make mistakes, even when we don't stand for what's right, he steps in and says, I'm not going to leave you. I know you. I lived in your shoes. I, I understand what it's like to be human. It was the book of Hebrews say he was tempted in all ways. He understands the difficulty of this life, what we have to go through. He gets us. And he doesn't leave us either. And so the prophet Jeremiah gives this additional word to his people who are now in exile. And he tells them something that is so powerful for you and I right now in this day and age of uncertainty. I, wanna, I, he, I want you to hear this from the prophet Jeremiah. And it was a message to those exiles in that time. Listen to this. Prophet Jeremiah chapter 29. A lot of you know this graduation text, verse 11. But there's something that was said before it that is really crucial. And it was a message to those people that were in Babylon there in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those that I've carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. What do we do in this time of uncertainty? Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons, give your daughters into marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Don't fall back. Also, now listen to this. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper too. What do we do in this season of exile? What do we do in this time of uncertainty? God literally says, live your life. You can't just keep living in fear, Daniel and you buds. He's talking literally to these guys right there. He's like, listen, do not live in fear. Don't be sitting there worrying about the future. Go live your life. In our Adventist history, there was a time of great hardship that we experienced. Those early years as pioneers, there was this thought, man, maybe Jesus will come in this time, and he doesn't. We made some mistakes in interpreting some ideas and theology. You could say this was pre-Adventism. And there, a, a word of counsel came from Ellen White. Later on, years later, she looked at that moment of great disappointment. And she said, we Adventist people must continue to plant our fields, 
collect the harvest, live each day as if Jesus would come, but still doing the work of everyday life. You can't cloister yourself up into a hole and hide there in fear and worrying about the future because, but what if? You're right. What if? What if things don't go the way you had planned? What if? You know what if? Look at this next verse. Verse 8, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Don't let the prophets of diviners among you deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams that they encourage you to. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I didn't send them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For 70 years, when they're completed for Babylon, I'll come to you and fulfill my good promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. In your season and in my season of struggle, in our community season of struggle, in the world's season of uncertainty, God says live your life and know that I'm with you, but pray for peace in those spaces. Be a person of blessing and know that I'm with you in this. Know it at the depth of your core and your heart's yearning for all these wonderful things. Know that I have a plan for you. Know that I have a plan for this community. And it's a difficult thing as a young adult to navigate the challenges, the transitions from one thing to another. It's tough. And sometimes you just need someone to just kind of stand next to you and just like, dude, I'm here for you. I'm with you. I understand this is a hard space. There's a beautiful study that came out just recently that's about to be published. That I got to hear it from my advisor there at Fuller Theological Seminary. And it was this, that when young adults understand their church communities, know the challenges that they're facing, and empathize deeply with them, the negative emotions that they experience in this time that are super high actually begin to decrease when they know that their church community is there with them. And the positive emotions that they're experiencing in this season of young adulthood, because there's so much that's amazing in this time. I love this season of life. It is incredible. The opportunities, the newness of it, it's amazing. These feelings, they only increase when they know their church is right next to them, alongside of them. I'm with you in this. I got you. When our elder team is here to support you, when our leadership teams are here serving you, we're here for you in this season. Our pastoral team, both Kelly and I and all of our, man, we're here for you in this. Young adults, we want you to know you're not in this alone. We're on your side, especially the Lord. And so I want to leave you with these five practical practices to live in this liminal space with that I think will really bless your life tonight. I want you to just think about these for a moment, these five practices. Write them down. Think about these. The first one is this, story that we can learn from our brother Daniel and his buddies, Practice advocating for yourself. Daniel was about to be cut up with his homies, and he said, wait, wait a minute. I do not stand for abuse, violence, and hardship. No, no. Some of you are in toxic spaces, toxic relationships, toxic circumstances, very abusive family systems, you've got to advocate for yourselves and get help. Get out and get help. It is so vital. Daniel and his buddies, they said no, and they had to speak up. It's hard. Sometimes we don't feel like we have a voice. It feels as though your voice is literally being choked out. I can't even speak. And sometimes you need a friend who sees the hurting to speak for you. I want to encourage you to be that kind of friend to your buddies that are around you. When you hear anything, see anything, speak up for them. 
That is so, so important. Solomon writes in the Proverbs, in the multitude of many counselors is wisdom. Daniel literally gathered his buddies around him in this time of crisis. They had the first young adult prayer meeting that's recorded in scripture. They're like, hey, we gotta gather, we gotta pray. How many of us now in this season in young adulthood might do well to spend more time gathering God's people to help each other out? This is your time to practically do that for each other. And you've got to do it for yourself too. Because you are valuable. Do not let a guy or girl or a system or anyone put you down to be less than. You have to realize not every religious organization or ideology is equal. I know some of you love to represent maybe relativism. And others of you know I believe in absolute truth. Well, I'm just going to tell you I believe in truth fully and foremost that there is a truth that I can anchor my life by. And if that religious system does not believe in the equality of life of everyone, it is not a religious system worth following. That is so important. And so Daniel and his friends recognizing we've got to advocate for ourselves. Number two, a practice that I think is so important is practicing a hopeful mindset. You've got to recognize God hasn't abandoned you. And so you've got to turn on your mind's reality to look at things through a different light. Romans chapter 12 tells us we've got to renew our minds. Doesn't mean you have to embrace everything your mind believes. Some of us have been enchained and imprisoned by our own thinking about ourselves. The scripture says no. You need renewal of your mind. Do not believe that God has abandoned you. In your season of uncertainty, God is with you. Do not rest in despair. Imagine if Daniel and his buddies resorted to depression and just fully gave up. Like, I'm just just done. I can't. Viktor Frankl, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, the World War II psychologist and Jewish prisoner of war in a concentration camp, he writes in his book, He recounts that many people eventually died in the concentration camps who were not also sick and weren't violently killed simply for one sad thing. They lost hope. They believed they were fully abandoned, that they would never get out. He recounts the story of a man who who was yearning to see his children again. And he got to a point where he started speaking these words out, I will never get out of here. I'll never see them. It will never happen. Victor tried his best to talk his friend out of it. No, listen, come on. Several days later, literally just died. A week before, a week before they were released. And so we've got to practice a hopeful mindset. Sometimes to practice that, you might need help along the way. A therapist, good friend. Good community. Recognize that not every friend is trained to help you with your issues. Can we say that out loud? Some of us are relying on our friends. I want to speak to many of us who are hurting in our emotional state. Not all of your friends can help. Please, it's very difficult for them to navigate this with you. You can't just rely on them and think it'll be fine. You need to also seek professional help. Seek for communities of religious help. Absolutely. The Bible says those who are hurting, sick, and ill, gather the elders together, pray, anointed. Absolutely. We're here for you too. But I'm going to encourage you to get help too professionally. There's some amazing Christian professionals. So we've got to get into a space where, Lord, please renew my mind. Thirdly, practice doing what you practically can do. You know, You can help yourself by just doing some practical things in your life in this season of uncertainty. A lot of times we kind of give up. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. So then a lot of young adults spend a lot of years not in a season of trying to figure things out, but just kind of resort to like, I just don't know. Friend, I want to encourage you to not have to wait for God to speak and come down literally in the flesh to say, hey, listen, David, I think you should consider registering for these classes and and then you can do this and this will be the next step we don't need to wait for God to be this clear with us 
recognize your natural talents, recognize just things that God has placed in front of you, job opportunities, you're like, I'll consider it, okay. And as you're moving through these things, they're not holding you back. Don't be depressed that you're 30 and you still don't feel like you've got an education, you're not in a relationship that's forever and you don't have all the money you want. Do not be depressed about that. If you're moving forward, you're doing good things, recognize that God calls you to do something practical. There's that prayer and promise of that story of an individual who's in a flood zone and he's praying on the top of his roof, God, help me. Helicopter comes by. Hey, let's get out of here. No, the Lord will rescue me. Bro, this is a practical help to you. Get on that helicopter. Go. So do what you can do on your own. I remember a buddy of mine blaming the academic advisor in college for having him stay there for a year longer. It was their fault. Don't you have the handbook? Didn't you map out the next four years? You checked the classes? No, I didn't think I needed to do that. Hmm, okay. So it's their fault. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay, okay. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. Some people do a lot and don't go far because they don't apply knowledge also wisely and rightly. That is wisdom. Last two things I want to share with you as the band comes up. Practice also patience. There will come a day when this season will be over. This season will be over at some point. But you've got to practice patience in this time. It may not be now, but there is a day coming when it will finish. Learn to be content with the season and stay connected to the Lord, just simply saying, God, teach me what I need to learn right now. Help me to get everything out of this time that I can get. Sometimes we rush through a season because we're just uncomfortable with it. But God might be yearning that you would learn something here, something in this time. I don't know how many of you have heard some of your buddies talk about when a car crash happened right in front of them. I remember when I was leaving, actually, an event, and there we were in L.A., and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's, let me just make sure I get the directions right. I don't want to be driving around with my phone trying to figure it out. Let me just take a pause for a moment. I figured it out, and I got it. I'm going literally the car in front of me, and someone ran a red light, boom, crash, awful, right in front of me, wow, if I wouldn't have taken that moment just to be patient, listen, I don't need to be figuring everything out quick, what's my phone, I text and drive sometimes, but let me be patient, let me try and do this the right way, and lastly, this last and final practice is this, practice worshiping in the waiting. Worship in the waiting season that you're in. Worship the Lord in this time. There is no better use of your time than growing deep in Jesus. The Daniel and his buddies aligned themselves with the kingdom and that kept them faithful. Sometimes the season of faithfulness doesn't have to be all that hard when you follow the Lamb of God wherever he's leading you. Lord, I don't know what to do right now, but you know what? I do know where you're going, and I'm going to go there. I do know where God's people are going to be this night. I'm going to go there. I do understand that, Lord, right now, this is a hard season I'm in, and, but I hear there's a prayer meeting here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to worship with God's people. Don't ever take for granted life groups. Go where God's people are. I know some of you in a season, you can't get to one. I get it. I'm just, I'm just saying when you align yourself with worshiping in the mornings even, on your own, without anyone else, you're worshiping and you're waiting and God will bring you strength, encouragement, and blessing. Worship in the waiting. I love these words by the band FFH. The song entitled Worship in the Waiting. Listen to this. I've seen the Red Sea part and I've seen the mountains move. But now it seems so dark I can't even feel you. If you choose to be silent, I'll be silent too. I will worship in the waiting, quiet before you, Lord. Until your voice is like manna that falls from the sky, I will worship in the waiting. I will walk in the sand beneath my feet. Through the winter and though the wind is blowing, though the ground is frozen underneath me, I will worship and not grow bitter because I know you see the end from it all. And with the spring will come the rain and I'll see what has been gained in the waiting. 
there is so much good coming in store for us as a community. As we recognize that God is for us in this time of uncertainty. That this liminal space, actually, when you study these more and more, you realize that liminal spaces provide something beautiful. Because in the uncertainty, we're also challenged to grow deeper. Deeper in some of these practices. Deeper in understanding ourselves. And through the mistakes and failures, we learn so much as well. We learn about ourselves. And recognizing, listen, those will happen. Sin happens. Challenges happen. But that doesn't mean you are failure in who you are. God will use those things, your mess, to bring out a message. God will use the pit you were in to bring you to being on a pulpit. And he will use the things you've been through to be a blessing to someone else around you. So recognize the blessing in this season of uncertainty. Amen.